Mayor Byrne is moving to Cabrini Green, and Alexander Haig is trying to get over a bushwhacking in Washington, D.C. Tonight on Inside Politics, a look at these stories and more. Good evening, everyone. I'm your host, Bruce Dumont. I thank you very much for joining us tonight, where for the next hour, we will examine this past week in politics with our guests, who are Tom Roser, president of the City Club of Chicago, who a couple of weeks ago was described by Basil Talbot as one of the real tigers in the, the civic movement here in the Chicagoland area. He also described him as a feisty promoter, and if you have heard Tom on this program in the past, you also know he is a feisty participant in inside politics. Sheldon Gardner is also here. He is past president of the Independent Voters of Illinois and state chairman of the Illinois John Anderson campaign. Gentlemen, don't get me going early in the program. Phil Crone is also here. He is political consultant and campaign strategist to a number of uh, political luminaries in the Chicagoland area, including Richie Daly, Tom Hines, Howie Carroll, and former Lieutenant Governor Neil Hardigan. Our phone number is 236-1531. If you would like to talk politics at any point in the next hour, do give us a call. If you want to question our guests or challenge our guests, they, they tend to say some rather strange things as uh, the program unfolds, and I'm sure you will want to uh, challenge them on that. And we would also like to know how you feel about Mayor Burns' move into Cabrini-Green and also how you feel about Alexander Haig having his wings clipped earlier this week by President Reagan. These are our two main topics of discussion this evening. We'll also be talking a little bit later on about Paula Parkinson, who has everyone in Washington holding their breath and keeping their fingers crossed. 236-1531 is the telephone number. We'll turn to your calls shortly. Gentlemen, let us begin. Let's put uh, Mayor Byrne right up uh, the front of the burner tonight and find out how you feel about her move to uh, move into the Cabrini Green housing project. Sheldon Gardner, what do you it's think really of the idea? It's really marvelous when in the same week you can appoint two anti-busing people to the school board and move into Cabrini Green. It's, she really is a noble successor to Mayor Daly who can play both ends against the middle. It was a very, very clever ploy. Phil Crum? <clears throat> well, I'm not sure it was a ploy because um, <clears throat> the mayor, <clears throat> despite any uh, arguments uh, one might have with her, is a person who m moves <coughs> to a great deal on her own personal emotions and attitudes, and I think that she was really aggravated the fact that from her apartment at 111 East Chestnut, she could look out at an area that was totally out of control in terms of, of, of civility, uh, tranquility, the idea of a, of a civilized society, and she thought that her presence there could do something about it, and that obviously has. Now, some critics might say that uh, it's artificial, that her presence there is on, in, on an unreal situation in the sense that the other housing projects aren't going to have her, but I understand now she has plans that she's going to have a residence practically at every major uh, housing project, Robert Taylor Homes on the south side, Henry Horner Homes on the west side, and Cabrini on the north side, well. and, is, and is going to go to all those places, and it does add a spirit. Interesting thing, <clears throat> more than anything else, is that it, it highlights two things about public housing, uh, that her presence there, in a sense, shows how it can be solved. Number one, it's bad to have a low-income group in high-rise housing 100 percent. If there were any way to to change the percentages and lure middle-income people to a significant percentage of, of, of a public housing and turn it around, that would be helpful. The second thing would be security. Obviously her presence brings more security and every building uh, of a nature where you have three, four, five hundred apartments deserve security. Tom, what do you think of the I idea? I think it ranks with the all-time great stratagems as Dwight Eisenhower, I shall go to Korea, which in 1952 he said, and he went to Korea and he had lunch with the guys there, the GIs. They uh, they wanted to have lunch with the And she's going to Division in Sedgwick. And uh, when he came back, he knew nothing more that the fact that he was there. And I think essentially Mayor Byrne goes to Cabrini Green. She shall go to Cabrini Green and I think she'll chase the mob out. She'll chase the gangs out. They'll go over to Robert Taylor Holmes. It's sort of like a case and then she'll go to Robert Taylor Holmes and they'll go back to Cabrini Green. But essentially I think by keeping them moving uh, it's good for the city. It uses the CTA. It uses the cabs. And I think really you ought to say that she has really kept the city moving, and that's a good idea. And I really, the city club has applauded her because really what she has done is to really, by going into, I think by going into Cabrini Green, she has dislodged the, uh, I think, the crime there and chased them somewhere else, which is, uh, I think, what you ought to be able to do in this case. But I think so far than that, there isn't anything more than that that she has done. Shelley? I think uh, Jane Byrne is really quite underestimated. You know, you made the distinction between a ploy and an, ac and an action. An action for good motives can still be political. I think she's a bright lady. She was once described by someone as somebody who's a political survivor. And uh, she's got a lot, a lot of strings left in her political bow. She's going to be around a long time. 
What about uh, the impression that, that you alluded to that, you know, she's one of the few people that you know that can appoint uh, uh, two, uh, two anti-busing people to the uh, school board in one week and also say she's going to move into Cabrini Green. What is this going to do as, insofar as her relationship with the black community? Is it going to solidify it or are they going to look at it as a, as a grandstand play? It depends upon uh, the long term. Uh, she has um, adroitly suggested that she's not going to be a full-time resident of public housing. She has adroitly um, uh, decided not to become just a near north side public housing uh, uh, tenant. She's going to have apartments, in, 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 <laughs> as I understand from what her comments have been and what they've discussed in the newspaper, she's going to have uh, apartments in all, th in all three major uh, public housing uh, neighborhoods. And maybe... And I think she's going to spend time in them. I think she's going to sleep overnight. Anybody who thinks she isn't going to do it, to begin with, she'll do it just to prove she can do it. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, I think she wants to prove it that that uh, that that she can do it, and that other people. When is the novelty going to wear off? Well, if that's when, frankly, when the novelty wears off, that's what frees her more than anything else. She can't move out, quote unquote. She couldn't give up this project. Uh, until the novelty wore off, because if she did beforehand, they'd say she didn't mean what she said. But I don't think she's going to give it up during her whole two years. I think she's going to be living in public housing for some percentage of the time. I'll tell you one thing. If, if it ever gets to 10 below zero, 20 below zero, she'll be in public housing. <clears throat> I'm telling you, she, this, this, as Sheldon said, she's not, you know, nobody ever said she was dumb. Okay, you are all in your own way political consultants. You do it professionally. Sheldon does it. Uh, I give it away. He gives it away. <laughs> He's a girlfriend. And, uh, and, and, and Tom Rose, Rosie gives it away. <laughs> I try <laughs> to sell it. <laughs> what do you do to sell it? <laughs> you and nobody's like, give it away. It ruins the market. No, you're, you're a corporate chieftain. You get paid okay. by... Yeah, the and, you're a, and you're a tiger. We know that. Right. It's, it's been in print now. It's official. Right. Um, what advice would you give to those who may be thinking of challenging Mayor Byrne? Because one of the comments that has come out in a number of news analysis pieces in the last couple of, uh, you know, s since it happened uh, less than a week ago, is that perhaps this has disarmed all of her opponents. How would you, how would you battle against it, Tom? No, I would say that uh, I am not knocking Mayor Byrne when I say that these are short-term Band-Aid uh, things that she's going into Cabrini Green. That's not going to solve the problem of poverty there. It's not going to solve the problem of the gangs. She is going to dislodge those gangs, and they're going to go somewhere else. Maybe and, Gary. And I think that it's a good idea for her to do this. And I'm not even being cynical when I say this. A person who runs against her has got to take the problem of poverty and say, "Look, when you uh, okay, you haven't solved these problems. You've been a showboat. That's what I would do. I'd say that you, you have, you've been very courageous and you certainly have gained all kinds of press, but so far as the enduring problems of Chicago, you haven't solved them. And it. she'll say, well, what have you done? Well, uh, what, what, trees what do ideas plant? do you, that's right, what trees do you plant? <laughs> well, that's the old story that when, for example, you are running against somebody who has not solved those enduring problems, you can say, well, give me a chance and I will. So essentially, I think those problems are really unsolvable if we want to move in on them and really solve them by the very root causes. Well, the person who really understands her very well is the person who masterminded the Daly's campaign for state's attorney, my friend sitting here, Phil Crone, because Phil understands very well that the way you beat her is to let her beat herself. You can't take her on really in a gab fest and handle her, because she's very quick and she's really quite good in handling it, but you can let her beat herself by by some of the things she does, because she is very uneven. And with you, you mentioned Daly. Uh, one of the points of Daly's campaign for state's attorney, and one of the things that has received the most publicity since he was elected, is his gang unit. He's going to get the gangs. That's what he promised, and that's what he at least has said in rhetoric. In, 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 uh, and in there have been some months. indictments. And, and there have been some indictments. Is she, by doing this and by going after the gangs, is she taking his most viable issue away from him? I don't think so. I, you know, I'll tell you something. Anybody who thinks they can understand what's going on this week, just off the top of their heads, uh, obviously is making an incorrect statement. And I, I would say this, in, you know, to her benefit. She didn't go take a public opinion survey ahead of time to, to decide what she's doing. I really think, and I reserve the right to be very critical of her on, you know, but <laughs> I think she really did what she's doing, not out of an idea that this is a political gimmick, because some of us, the night she did it, thought, you know, she was nuts. You know, that, I mean, the, just the original thing, the way it, it happened, you know, like, 
somebody, I had a meeting with somebody on a Sunday morning, and he says, what do you think of the mayor moving into Cabrini Green? So I laughed, and he said, no, he said it, she said it to some reporter or something. So I thought, it's out of context. And then we go by the newsstands, and I bought the Sun-Times and Tribune the night before, and there were no headlines about moving Cabrini Green. That's the headline, Sunday morning. Now, my, 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 my first feeling was, you know, I was one of shock, you know, that there was no rational thought as to is this politically smart or not politically smart or whatsoever, you know, I, whatever. The but you, the point is that she didn't do it on a political basis. If it turns out to her political benefit or if it hurts her politically, that's not the reason she did it in the first place. She was offended. This is her city. She is the mayor, and there she is at 111 East Chestnut, the, the lady of all she surveys, and there, within, if you look in a telescope where she could almost grab it, like, you know, King Kong and Fay Ray could just reach out and grab it's it. There urban are, cancer. There are this urban cancer that she can see, and she, and, and no, no, you can't blame her for poverty, you can't blame her for building the projects, you can't blame her for those things, but she says this is her city right now, and she's not going to have lawlessness, so she's going to move there like a third grade school teacher and wrap everybody on the knuckles, and I'm going to be a good example, and we're going to show that you can live there and that people respect each other. That was what her, her thinking was. As a political strategist, though, you mentioned that 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 it, it was irrational that she acts in some irrational way. Well, how do you combat that? Because sure. there is a combustibility that 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 she has demonstrated, and she knows that she can get ink and she yeah. can get international okay. uh, acclaim by doing these okay. type of things. Okay. And she's I, done it in the past, and she and she did it with the Cabrini uh, issue. The person who I respect most politically, I mean, of all the people I've been associated with, the person that I respect the most in terms of intellect, ability to solve a problem. Honestly, Thanks, wait a minute, no, is Tom Hines. <laughs> but somebody who I respect in terms of sagacity said to me recently, don't let this, don't let Tom Hines go up against Jane Byrne because she will chew him up, spit him out, and use him for dental floss. Now, that means to me that this person whom I respect who said that, uh, has a has a a significant point that she is a tough person to combat. Now, Sheldon said that she beats herself. It was an unusual situation, and she's controlling herself. I mean, she has not since our little fuss that we had the night on radio. If you look in the newspaper, she has not been fighting with anybody, uh, particularly you no know, personalities. She's been going on issues. North Loop, which got yeah. raves. I was going to say, Phil, don't you think though? Shelley has put his finger on it. Uh, uh, she she beats herself on this issue as well. After the short term headlines on the hoopla is over, problems of Cabrini. She'll have a new Green. set of headlines. Pardon me. She'll have a new set of headlines. Well, well wait. Uh, uh, problems that she that she is temporarily helping by being there come back, and uh, they're bound to come back. Therefore, she is going to beat herself on this issue. But if we talk, wait a minute. If we talk about rationality, it's not rational to expect her to have major solutions to these major problems. Nobody expects her to. Um, it's bigger than city problems. Exactly. They're national. They, they're racial. They represent years of oppression, uh, poverty, things that have nothing to do with uh, municipal government. But there's something that you have to understand. If you saw Being There, the movie Being There, and what was that network movie, more than anything in our vicarious society, people love entertainment. I don't care what the news media say. Uh, about her on the editorial pages, the the people, the city editors love her. I mean, h how many times did you used to buy every edition of a newspaper? I mean, she can, you know, in one, the course of one day, you have to buy every edition of the newspaper. Walter Jacobson, you w you watch him at ten o'clock, not for him, but for what he's going to say about city issues. And she is entertainment as 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 much as anything else. Uh, I guess I, I agree with Shelley that uh, this is not entertainment. This is intriguing, but she's playing now. Pretending you don't to solve think it's problems, she's pretending to solve problems. You're so jaded that uh, that can't be solved. And by trying to move into Cabrini Green, she only isolates herself when she must move out with the problem still. Remains. Isolates herself by moving into Cabrini Green. She no. When she moves out, it's going to be all there. She's that not the moving out. Don't when you understand? She does she's move not out. going. You know what? Uh, she's going to love it. Uh, she, wait a minute. Let's say that. Remember the movie, the, not the movie, the look, TV series. Politics Good is not times. like an on. What if JJ came and said, "Dino bite, Mama, the mayor moved down the hall." That's an episode. Next week, uh, the, you have a new episode. 
Yeah, but she you don't you don't leave episodes hanging like this. It's not that kind of scenario. What I say is, having moved in there, some time for a commercial. Yeah. Okay. Let's all eat Quaker oats, everybody. Right. Now, <laughs> let, let me let me let me throw another political name in here, who also has a uh, a master stroke, and that's Ronald Reagan. Because last or shortly after uh, uh, the decision was made, and Jay McMullen was over there talking to the press, he said that he might invite President Reagan to spend a night there. Now, one of the goals that that many people in the city have is to tear down Cabrini Green. Now, if she were to bring the President of the United States to not stay there... Nancy. Which, not Nancy. Not Nancy, no. Nancy would stay back at the Drake. <laughs> but uh, the tree if the President might would go there, and I think he probably would, is it not conceivable that by, by lobbying directly with the President of the United States that he would move to have Cabrini Green tore down? Well, Nancy would think Cabrini Green is a kind of a color. You know, Cabrini Green, I mean, you know, as you would say. Sapphire blue yeah, and Cabrini yeah, that's Green. Right. But uh, I think, that, I think that, the, uh, that the president probably would visit under very, very quick circumstances, probably on his horse, <laughs> and uh, sort of in and out. I disagree. Uh, I, I, don't think that, uh, I don't think that he would make any... He would not try. He'd be there very shortly and uh, shake hands with Mayor Byrne and out, walking out escorted by about 10,000. Do you agree with that, or do you think he'd stay? Oh, stay and all night? You know, the... With Jane Byrne. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 in separate apartments. The I'm not suggesting... No, in the no Blair Lady. House. The yeah, Cabrini, Cabrini Green is going to have its own Blair House. His okay. constituency ain't in Cabrini Green, okay. friends. Well, but hold on a minute. He's but he's the president of the United States. The, and the he's exotic a thing about Jane Byrne is that everybody does the unreal. You know, I call downstairs and called out to my wife that Jane Byrne was going to Cabrini Green, and Carol says to me, what kind of story are you telling me? What are you putting me on again? You know, the whole situation becomes so strange that I could see people traipsing in and out to get a piece of the action Yeah, but it. it's getting to the point now where nobody's, nobody should be shocked when she comes uh, out with an idea that is, you know, physically possible. She has Charlie I'll, Swivel, she'll do well. I what? will bet. Charlie Swivel. I will bet, right, and I'll say it right and keep it on the tape, I will bet that if she invites President Reagan to spend a night at Cabrini Green, he'll spend the night. You're on. And it's oh, a good oh, steak no, dinner? I, and I'm going to see that you buy that stuff. No, 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 no. Bruce is, is right. Not, it might take nine helicopters, and God knows what the, the Secret Service wouldn't like it, but he will do it. Because you know what? He said you know what he's going to say? Well, the President of the United States, th if there's one square block, one square foot where the President of the United States can't go, then there's something wrong with this country. Yeah, but you're talking about staying all night. And What's wrong with staying all night? It's better than the South Bronx. It's better about <laughs> six o'clock at night. I mean, that's, that's a long night. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to turn to telephone calls now, 236-1531. We'd like to know how you feel about Mayor Burns' uh, upcoming move into the Cabrini-Green uh, project. And also, we would like to know how you feel about Alexander Haig. We're going to be uh, switching our gears and talking about uh, Alexander Haig's tough week in Washington uh, in just a few moments. But let's go to the calls. 236-1531. Good evening, Kerry. You're on the air. Yes, hello. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, it seems to me that Mayor Burns' move is a piece of grandstanding to somehow placate the uh, minorities after this uh, appointment of the two school board, uh, the new appointments of, uh, of white people who were against busing. All right, let's let Phil Crone respond to that uh, suggestion of linkage. I don't think she was thinking of the two together, so if she should, if she didn't, you shouldn't, but you might, you she might be... dummy, Phil. Huh? She's no dummy, Phil. She's pretty smart when it comes to politics. Oh, I didn't say she is a dummy, but I She's don't think... You've got to think of everything. I'm sure she thought of it. I think she thought of Ruth Love, too. After all, whoever heard about Ruth Love coming in here at the time, Ruth Love was blanked out of the, out of the press for three days as a result. But that's Phil's comment. No, Ruth Love was black. As a matter of fact, everything was, was, uh, was, was blacked out in terms of uh, her... Uh, for publicity. But I don't think that that was the reason she did it, just because that was a byproduct. In other words, that quality gets her in trouble. It also does good things for her. Um, the point is, is that that nobody has ever done anything like this before, and to the people in the projects, they might think she's nuts for doing something voluntarily 
that they would not do if they had an option to get out, but they still admire the idea that, that, that she cared enough to come. I can't see that they admire it from talking to people, not specifically in the project, well, but from talking to other people. To call this whole thing entertainment is the height of naivete. This is hardly good times, like people are moving in with the darkies, and then this is where it's going to be at. It's, to call that entertainment, these people are living there. She still moves in there as the mayor and walks out of there every day with her bodyguards. No, it's, the rest of the people are still mo living there in their conditions, which are not going to be improved it, beyond painting the elevator. If she door. doesn't handle that well, it becomes the long-term problem that I discussed. But there's something else that I want to say, in, not in her, de in her defense, but to explain why I think I'm right. On, when I say entertainment, I'm not saying there's en anything entertaining about public housing. What I'm suggesting is that in terms of just watching it on television, not participating in it, and frankly, whether you are live in public housing and watch TV or live on Lakeshore Drive and watch TV, that the news of these unbelievable things happening in your own city is entertainment. Now, life itself might not be entertaining. That's what I mean by this whole vicarious thing. The mayor, the mayor is on the front page of every newspaper in the country. In the world. In the right. world. By now, she's, I mean, in, I heard in uh, Italy, Japan, everywhere. She isn't very big in South Africa, I want to tell you. Not very big. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you see, here's something. If they can get South, if there are South African newspapers that are saying what she's doing and are knocking her, we get, she would get the reprints and that would really make her popular in the area where you say she's not. What is to be lived vicariously here? I mean, poverty, squalor, rats? No, no, no. She is elevating that. You see, even poverty, nobody, I mean, who wants to choose poverty? Nobody chooses poverty. I would not. Poverty like, chooses you. Well, I'm not sure about that one either, but but the point is that there are a lot of people who are poor. It's unfortunate. It would be great if we all had a strategy to 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 change it. But even poor people, even poor people enjoy attention. Right? I think they enjoy a square meal a whole lot better. Right, right. but Kerry, uh, we, we're going to have like to move both. on. I, you know, w one of the mayor's most. Sub Severe critics is Bob Wiederk of the Tribune. In his column uh, in this afternoon's papers, he said that Mayor Byrne is demonstrating a degree of leadership that her predecessors never have done. He also said that no one has had the sensitivity or the good sense to recognize the situation in Cabrini Green. And when you have one of her most severe critics make a comment like that, that uh, that is a little bit surprising. On that note, we do move on. Thank you very much. Richard, good evening. You're next. Good evening, Bruce. Sounds like you're having a good time. <laughs> we are. I, I wanted to say uh, a few comments about my my impression about Mayor Burns' move, and then uh, one of one of your guests, and I've forgotten his name, is a political consultant, Phil Crone. Phil Crone. I wanted to ask him a question afterwards. Go ahead. I I think this this move has the mark of, of true brilliance for the following reason. I think, I mean, the the political consequences uh, are unassailable. It's uh, a move that will increase the mayor's popularity. It has given her international attention. Uh, which actually she already had. I recall in the uh, mayor's convention in Jerusalem last year, she was uh, sort of the darling of the media. But I think it's, I, and I've, I've wondered about some of her behavior and some of her volatility, but I think this has uh, the markings of true earnestness. I, one, of the, one of your guests made the comment that, uh, that she probably had the feeling this is my city and uh, damn it, uh, something's wrong and no one can do anything about it. I guess I'm going to have to do it myself. And, uh, I think that uh, that trait in her is believable. I think it may be believable actually because of the volatility we've seen that uh, people say, you know, anyone who can scream and yell uh, like the, uh, the city death business in the uh, city hall, I mean, that, that was honest. I mean, someone, someone who's trying to kick someone out of city hall removes their desk. Mm -hmm. That was coming from the gut. And uh, it might have been thought ludicrous or illegal or whatever. I think you make good points. But you had a people, question for Phil? Yeah. Okay, um, go ahead. I would I would ask you this. I think when Mayor Byrne Mayor Byrne started even her her candidacy with uh, an incredible flair for seizing sort of things in people's minds. I remember one of her ads on television, which had her standing in a parking lot that was supposed to be an emergency parking place that was unplowed. And I think since something like uh, Mayor Belandic wants you to park your car here. She she came in with a lot of flair, and, and I think her first year or so uh, was a little bit out of control with her relations with the press, with her relations with some of the city councilors, and I think she may have learned something, but my, my question to you is this. If you were her political advisor, 
if you were where, uh, I guess, the position that uh, Jay McMullen has, how would you <laughs> modify? <laughs> I don't know if you'd want that. Well, but let's talk about. Let's just talk about the daytime. <laughs> how would you modify her behavior, her relationship with the press, her relationship with uh, the political conflicts in the city to make her even more effective? Because I think the raw material is is spectacular. And All right, let's let uh, Phil respond. I agree, and I think. I think that any person who holds the position of mayor of Chicago uh, has the capacity to have a very smooth ride. Even though you can't uh, uh, solve all the problems, uh, rationally no one can expect you to. But in terms of her alliances and in terms of her becoming a popular figure and somebody who they say deserves re-election uh, to a considerable degree, let's say 60, 70 percent, as Daly did the first time he was reelected in 1959, <clears throat> she should start co-opting uh, and, and smoothing her relationships and having them being magnanimous enough to say, I was wrong, I'm sorry, like frankly when she attacked me uh, about a month ago, she was absolutely wrong in her facts. Yeah, this is the first anniversary of that. It was one month ago tonight. She was absolutely wrong. Uh, it was not the proper way to to, to fight her because frankly you can't debate her she won't let you get in a word she's a very effective on a one-to-one -one basis she just doesn't let you move in they did spell your name right in the papers though Phil. that is true <coughs> uh, but she can be magnanimous she is the mayor she can like for instance her relationships with the with the dailies uh, are are almost nil although she's been in terms of protocol respecting mrs. Daly uh, by inviting her to civic functions and uh, but but obviously there's a great deal of rancor, and I think that the dailies are absolutely right in it. The, but the only way that it's going to be turned around is by her initiative. Okay. And on that note, we're going to have to move on. Now let me identify. That was Philip Crone, who you've just heard speaking. He is political consultant and a campaign strategist. He's been involved in hundreds of campaigns over his uh, illustrious political career. He at one point worked for the Republican Party in uh, Cook County and uh, then switched over and became a Democratic consultant. He's consulted Richie Daly during his recent campaign for state's attorney. He County put the assessor. Republican Party where it is today. <laughs> Tom <laughs> Hines. <laughs> Locally. Uh, th Thomas Hines, uh, Howard Carroll, and uh, former Lieutenant Governor Neil Hartigan. Sheldon Gardner is also here, past president of the IVI and state chairman of the Independent, uh, of the Independent Voters of Illinois and the Illinois John Anderson campaign. Are you going to say that Sheldon Gardner put the IVI where it is, too? He put John Anderson where he is, today. <laughs> For a $220,000 job on Channel 7, isn't bad. I Not heard it. You want to know the truth? It's only $25,000. Oh. Truth. $25,000? Where did you hear that? A week? A week. An unimpeachable yeah. source. No, a year. He's making only 25 G's a year for doing that? Well, anyway, and our other guest this evening, who's been uh, casting aspersions on our other guests, is Tom Roser, president of the City Club of Chicago and uh, one of the uh, regular members, as as well as Sheldon Gardner and Phil Crone of the Inside Politics panel. Let me mention a couple of things, because uh, Tom mentioned, uh, uh, said that, that Phil Crone was responsible for the uh, the destruction and the current status of the Republican Party. Um, sure, there are some that, there are some <laughs> that would probably agree with that, but let me mention that, that two weeks from tonight, on April 9th, we will be talking about the, the general topic that evening is whatever happened to the Republican Party in Chicago. And who cares? <laughs> and, well, you can call in and ask that question if you'd like. Our guests are going to be J. Robert Barr, who is the chairman of the Republican Party in Cook County, Bob Athey, who is a political consultant to W. Clement Stone, one of the chief contributors to the Republican Party, and also our guest that evening will be Don Neltner, Republican Ward Committeeman of the 43rd Ward, who has some ideas about waking up the Republican Party. The last of the firebrands. The last of the firebrands. The mayor of Old Town. And that will be, April 9th, happens to be the 50th anniversary of the last day of the reign of Big Bill Thompson, the last Republican ever to sit in City Hall. Couldn't so, you have a special show for April 1st? <laughs> <laughs> no, but on the subject of our program next week, we were scheduled to have Mayor Byrne and April Fool. Uh, she will not be able to join us. Uh, she had intended live to be from, here. Live However, from Cabrini Green. <laughs> Now, Mayor Byrne, <laughs> let me get through the promos, guys. Uh, <laughs> Mayor Byrne was supposed to be here next week. She will not be able to be here. However, I have been assured by her press office, Andy Bajanski, who wouldn't lie to anyone, that she will be here uh, later in the month of April. So I, I sold Bajanski the house he lives in. <clears throat> really? Did you get a good deal? <laughs> we both did. He wanted it, and I made a profit. <laughs> Where is it from, Gabriti Green, anyway, girl? <laughs> Due west. One other point, and then we will get back to telephone calls. We're going to start a new feature next week on the program. Uh, 
if you are a member of a political organization, Republican, Democratic, Independent, Vegetarian, Communist, whatever it happens to be, what we're going to do in the midway point from uh, on Inside Politics from now on, we're going to read a couple of announcements that have to deal with, uh, with local political organizations. So if your ward organization or your township is having a fundraising dinner or you're bringing in uh, some well-known speakers that are coming in to address your group or you've got a picnic or whatever it happens to be, just drop me a line, Inside Politics, WBEZ, 228 North LaSalle Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60601. And in the lower left-hand corner of the envelope, just so we can sort it out in a hurry, put the word bulletin board. We're going have a political inside politics bulletin board every uh, Thursday night, roughly around this same time at 7:30, because there are a lot of political organizations that do uh, that have a lot of interesting programs that go on, and it is unfortunate, but most radio stations do not promote uh, political events through the public service process. Well, since the, the purpose of this program is to uh, deal in the world of politics, we thought that we would give you an opportunity to share with our audience, and I would assume that most of the people listening to this program are real dyed-in-the-wool political animals and would be would be interested if your particular organization has a special fundraising uh, event of any kind coming up. So drop me a line, Inside Politics, WBEZ, 228 North LaSalle Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60601, and put the word bulletin board in the lower left-hand corner, and every week at this time, we'll read uh, two or three events that are coming up for those that are politically inclined. Back to calls. Jack, you're on the air. Yes, I want to make a couple of brief comments on um, uh, Mayor Burns' move and Ronald Reagan's move with Alexander Haig. Okay. Okay, first off, uh, with Mayor Byrne, I think she's a diamond in the rough, very rough, um, and I didn't think it was really necessary for her to make this move in order to show concern and take action in public housing. But since she's done it, I say God bless her, I wish her well, and I hope everything works out okay. Um, with respect to um, uh, Ronald Reagan's move with Alexander Haig, I thought it was a very fine move, an excellent move to give the um, responsibility over to George Bush. After all, he's the Vice President of the United States, and he should get involved as second in command. It's important for him. And I'm a little bit worried some, uh, as well about uh, Mr. Haig. Uh, he troubles me. And uh, the idea of that there's a flap that he uh, may have shown some resentment over having this uh, possibly taken away from him and given to someone else, uh, especially the Vice President, I, I feel good about that. And uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid for Mr. Ha uh, of Mr. Haig. I think he's a little bit too more, much of a warmonger instead of a negotiator, finding peaceful, honorable solutions rather than fighting everybody. All right, let's let uh, Tom Rosa respond. I, I, I just want point. to finish one brief thing, and okay. then I'll let him respond. All right. Um, I would like to see Mr. Haig resign and Ronald Reagan to appoint Henry Jackson as Secretary of State. Well, I certainly agree with you that uh, when we look at the at the job of crisis manager, Al Haig proved that he ain't a very good crisis manager with his own crisis. He didn't manage it very well. He managed uh, to create it. Yeah, he uh, he uh, shot his mouth off in front of a public microphone, which is a very bad thing when to did do. This and uh, he. Uh, Phil, you ought to get a subscription to the newspapers because this happened several uh, several days ago where, where Alexander Haig, in talking and testifying before the House Foreign Affairs Committee, said that uh, he was not overly enthused about decisions to put George Bush in charge of the crisis management in the, in the White House. And when he said that, he precipitated a problem. Instead of dealing as a diplomat should do inside and be a very negotiable guy, he wasn't. So I think that we've got a man, very fine, has got a lot of ability, and uh, he, however, I think proved that he shouldn't be a crisis manager and someone with a cool head should be like George Bush. Uh, thank you very much for your call. Let's uh, follow up on it by asking uh, the New York Times today uh, in a... Uh, analysis by Hedrick Smith said that this is going to have long-term ramifications on the relationship uh, of Reagan and Haig, not only to one another, but also insofar as the Allies are concerned. Al Haig was very popular with the Allies, and here, very shortly into the Reagan administration, the rug is being pulled out from under him on not only the, the national uh, uh, 
field, but also the international arena. No, I think it'll only be good because all administrations, one must remember, and especially Franklin Roosevelt's administration, had cabinet officers, Zickies fighting with Morgenthau, Morgenthau fighting in turn with, with Hull. This early and in the had, administration? Oh, yes, yes, started right off the bat. Matter of fact, Ickes really bugged everybody's phone in those early days, including Jim Farley's, which is one of the things that came out that was very interesting in 1933. So you have the beginnings of a very strong guy who is trying to take over, which is Haig. And he has a lot of ability. After all, he was the 38th and one-half president of the United States after Nixon was saying goodbye to the pictures on the wall. Haig was going around trying to run the country. So he has a little bit of a feeling for this thing. But, but having done that, I think that... Uh, I think he overreached, and I think, therefore, he's going to be very calm. Now, our, I think our allies were somewhat concerned about the general who was shooting his mouth off and testifying, we're going to fight here, we're going to draw the line here, we'll, but we're not going to take that. I think that we have to calm it down. So, essentially, the free market system of political action was that Al Haig overreached, he, he, uh, and he botched his own personal crisis. Therefore, he will be somewhat calmer, and I think the allies will be somewhat cooled as a result. I, I think his first problem began with Sinti tax and rhetoric when he's, they started talking about his botching up the language and talking about caveat and turning nouns into verbs and verbs into nouns because the the modus operandi of, of diplomats is language and when they started attacking his ability to communicate that was cutting his legs from under him i think the real reason why Haig was appointed Secretary of State was one simple reason, and that was because certain media were saying that he couldn't be appointed, and Reagan was going to show at the very beginning he had a mandate, he was the president, he'd appoint who he wanted to. Now, I would say something else in addition to I that, think it's first, Philip, yeah. that if Al Haig doesn't calm down, this president is going to make a personal fortune, I think, in popularity by firing yet another general, which is General Haig, the way another president fired General MacArthur. Right. Well, and let me say and one the, thing. And I, his first choice, so everybody says that Reagan's first choice for Secretary of State was Schultz, was Schultz who was really more popular with the Allies because Giscard d'Estaing and Schmidt had both been... Not with the Jews, but with the... Not at all with the Jews. I said with the Allies. Well, I would like to think that Israel is an ally. He's not very popular I'm with Israel. You're, you're talking about European allies. European okay. allies, yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to say that I never thought... I think Israel's was... a very important ally also, <laughs> I want to say for the okay. record. Okay, Phil, I wanted to say I never thought there was a syntax in Washington. But in terms of... Oh. Sure. Uh, in terms Dating of back to <laughs> Webster and Clay. S I M T A A. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Paula uh, Parkinson is uh, doling it out at the moment. You're getting slow, Phil. But I thought that, you know, we're, we're forgetting one thing. We're looking at the general. We're not looking at oh, the syntax. <laughs> oh, syntax. He's finally while. got it. 5%, 5%. Five percent. Five Joe, I think he's got it. <laughs> I think Phil, I think you're you're uh, operating in a loop tonight. You're about seven seconds behind. <laughs> That's right. Whatever. Well, I'm 14 seconds behind because you have a se seven-second loop to begin with. <laughs> I think this is the first time I've ever heard Tom speak good for the preppy. You know, when we when we look at the general and the general messes up, when we look at the preppy, I have always shared your feeling, Tom, of of it being a little difficult to get strong, warm feelings about the vice president. <laughs> well, I do say that I am pacing the floor once in a while, thinking of Georgie Bush in charge of our crisis. Center, but then the old actor reassured us by saying that also involves earthquakes. Uh, that's what he said yesterday. Would you like the crisis also involves earthquakes, and there isn't very much that George can do to worsen or to mitigate an earthquake. Therefore, I am concerned. I am not concerned very much. You once described uh, George Bush as the uh, Charles Nelson Riley of the Republican Party, Tom, and I'm wondering that's politically history. now. That's politically now, what does it do to 1984 if Reagan decides not to run? Is Reagan already casting his his lot with George Bush by giving no. him this plum? Reagan is very fortunate because he has decided to run himself. His health will keep up. George Bush is going to botch up one of the minor crises. It's probably an earthquake, probably a fire. Probably will go to Atlanta and be kidnapped himself, for all I know. <laughs> but the syntax and will be good. That's one thing. Haig has already disemboweled himself. <laughs> and so, as you see, all these actors fade away and fall away on the stage. Who remains? The old actor. So I think, essentially, he's doing very well. It's a cowboy you. movie, and he yeah, goes off right. in the sunset. But you know, the vice president will be very good when it comes to the vice president will be very good when it comes to verbiage and syntax. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the calls. Calvin, good evening. You're on the air. Good evening. I've been listening to your program, and I've racked my brain to try to come up with something to equal uh, Mayor Burns' uh, political daringness. And that is, uh, what would you and your guests think of the viability of Mayor Burns having uh, an apartment, not necessarily hers, the one next door to her apartment, set aside for? Uh, resident of uh, one of the Chicago housing projects for, uh, say, a week or two-week period so that uh, she can be uh, 
removed from the uh, stigma of having people say that she was acting in a very patronizing or condescending manner toward the uh, city's most poor. You mean have have a welfare family living at one level? Criticism that, that she would do that and give them uh, a taste of something that perhaps in reality they could not attain. And is, I think that, people, is that the reality? Uh, that's quite an indictment to say that. Uh, well, I'm I'm saying in the percep in the, in the perception of the media, I think that's how it would be perceived. The only would you encore, agree with that, Sheldon? Surely. The only encore that you can have to her act is finally getting Charlie Swivel. If you can get Charlie Swivel to move into public housing, then you've really achieved something. But that's not that, that's not the issue because Swivel is not a uh, uh, responsible the, leader. No, he doesn't have the visibility. I mean. The, what oh, made, what the, he certainly does That's no, what well. you're hired for, Crone, to keep him invisible, isn't oh, it? Oh, I'm not hired by Charles <laughs> Charlie Swivel. Charlie what's wrong with the Housing Authority? <laughs> I mean, if, if, if I had been hired by Charles Swivel, he would no longer be close to Mayor Byrne, right? All right, let, let's get uh, Calvin a, a chance to, to follow up on that. Calvin, I'd just like to pursue uh, your uh, comment that uh, that would uh, be beyond reality. Uh, it, I'm uh, disturbed to hear you say that because I'm thinking that Certainly, even those residents of Cabrini Green, if uh, by some miraculous uh, set of events they could uh, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, so to speak, uh, they do have an opportunity to eventually move in a, a building similar to where. What, what I'm what I'm saying is that on an individual basis, it is possible that that could happen. I think it's it's improbable, but well, it could happen. However, the, uh, however, I think the, the 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 perception, the way that the media would perceive that. I think that they would turn against her and they would say that you're trying to raise false hopes in yeah. the minds of millions of people. It's patronizing. Thousands of people. Yeah. And I think, it's, I, I think they would view that as, as more uh, yeah. patronizing than, than, than what she has uh, chosen to do. Yeah, Mayor, Mayor, that's an interesting <coughs> thing. We were talking about the president coming. You know, Mayor Byrne, who um, at least this one, one facet is what you might call the Mother Teresa facet. I mean, she's got other facets, but, you know, this concern for the poor living among them. But I wouldn't be surprised if before this whole thing is over, and I don't mean tomorrow, the next week or anything, if um, on the ne next American trip, if uh, His Holiness the, the Pope weren't invited to stay in, in, in Cabrini Green. And she would. didn't invite Mrs. Sadat. Well, there was only two days and it was a planned trip, but uh, oh. I, don't, I don't think that those conditions would be Monkey novel to Mrs. Stuff, Sadat. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it's interesting thing in terms context of different cultures that in many places in Carroll, Cabrini Green would be middle income. Well, housing. Sadat would pass on notice of Cabrini Green, wouldn't he? You're not Mrs. Sadat. <laughs> yeah, not Mrs. Sadat. Okay, we've got to go. Okay. Sure, thank you. Thanks very much. Let's move on. Henry, good evening. You're on the air. Yes, I'm finally uh, getting around to getting a comment in, and so I'll keep it brief here. All right. Um, I'd like to get the reaction to. First of all, I think the uh, move by Mayor Byrne was political genius. Uh, she's shown that she's not a dumb dame. Uh, my question is, do you think she has in some way outflanked some of the uh, um, black aldermen who um, have constituencies, large constituencies in the uh, public housing? Well, look at well I certainly do. Look at I, think she has, Tom Roser. I think she has outflanked the black aldermen. I want to make it very clear that I, I respect her for doing it, and it's a good thing, and I think it's, mm -hmm. it, it's more than a symbol. It'll do a lot. It will dislodge the gangs, but I think beyond that, uh, how much good is it going to do? That's what concerns me about it. Where is the end result of this? Is it really going to alleviate poverty? Is it really going to better the conditions there? How do you, I mean, how are you drawing a conclusion with uh, uh, moving in of Mayor Byrne and the dislodging of gangs? Oh, I think I mean, because... that's just like saying, um, because I can drive an MG, I can get in, I can, you know, move a 747. Well, I think, though, the runway. Her, don't you agree that her moving in with all the attendant uh, publicity and all the attendant services and the cops that are going to come in there, that that will dislodge the gangs? In fact, be hasn't serious. it up to now? Hasn't be it? serious. Be serious. You sound like some middle-class white person. I am a middle-class white well, person. I thank maybe, you for that. Maybe you, you know, maybe that's part of your problem. Not my problem, your problem. No, you I, I, got no problem. I may be middle class too, regardless of color. But the pro but the question is, uh, gangs who who have nothing to do with Mayor Byrne moving into an apartment. Well, as fellow middle class people, let's talk about the gangs that you and I evidently know nothing about. I would guess, fellow middle class person, that the gangs would move out if... A lot of cops who are going to assemble and who are going to move in with the mayor will move out. What do you think about that? Oh, that's not a fair statement of the facts. Oh, I think it I is. I mean, it's a, projection, it's a projection from where you sit. 
and it's a logical conclusion from your analysis, but it's not a fair statement of the facts. I think the, the, the chances of them moving out are far greater with the presence of the mayor of the city of Chicago than without the presence of the mayor of the oh, city of Chicago. Oh, be serious, gentlemen. Where are they going to go? They're going to Gary. go to another... They may go to Gary. Or they may go to, they may, they, they may go to another one of the developments. Well, I would ask the caller this, that uh, who has praised the mayor's visit there. No, I just you said it. No, 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 no. Well, I, I said some... it was a stroke of political genius. Well, okay, but I mean, if, if that isn't enough. going to happen, if that is not going to happen, then I would say that her visit there is absolutely meaningless. No, from I would a political standpoint, she is making currency at a time when she desperately needs it political currency out of moving well, into I understand, We understand that, sir. That you're yes. not the first to bring that up. But I, what I'm talking about is you do not believe that the attendance services, that the that the uh, the cops who are going to come in and everything else are not going to dislodge the gang, then you're about the first that I have heard, respectfully, sir, who has said that that isn't the case. No, it is not the case, All because right. that is not the whole problem. Okay, the we... quality of life cannot be measured by the existence of a few lawbreakers. There are you know, some who problem, disagree with you. I mean, the problem is basically one of uh, maintenance. If the, if the, if the no, housing... the problem is one of terror. Yeah. No, no, I mean, you're afraid. No, I'm not afraid. My dentist is at 51st and State, right at Robert Taylor Holmes. He's I am not afraid. He's making a mint. Huh? He's making a mint. He shouldn't be afraid. Well, on Phil's mouth, I suppose are you, he is, are but, you, not, <laughs> but not too many are, are you, are you make Are you making the, 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 the statement, Henry, if I hear you correctly, that you feel that there is not terror... In the in the housing developments, specifically I'm the Robert saying, the Robert Taylor, a, and that terror you, is being spread by gang members. Are you are I'm you denying that? To you, I'm saying to you that the larger problem is filth, mismanagement, and waste on the part of the people who are making money from the housing authority from its inception until today. Well, I think the I, Bells and all the people who are connected with him who are making very very large sums of money I would agree. sucking on the public tip. How, 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 how are they, how are they making agree. wait a minute. I, I how are they agree. making that money? How are they making the money? Yeah. Well let's just look into the, the uh the shenanigans that have been clearly uh, outlined by this fellow Renault Robinson about the gross mismanagement, how the housing authority pays too much for what it buys gets the least in quality. Name the, what what buying what? Well I mean if you I mean you you've had to listen to this man's indictment. For the last, there haven't been uh, any indictments. No, he's made some very strong public indictments about the mismanagement of the Chicago Housing Authority. Okay, but name one. Name one of them? Yeah. Well, the, the elevator operator, the, 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 the servicing of the elevator. Yeah, and that's a question of terror, too, because you know what the truth is, at least right. from what I can see? What? A lot of money is paid for elevator maintenance, mm -hmm. and they're not being maintained in many instances. And the reason they're not being maintained is because the... People are supposed to maintain them. Are scared to death to go maintain them. That's Listen, right. an elevator is basically a servo mechanism, gentlemen. That any yeah, well but while you're sitting screwing the thing, and somebody comes and wa and yeah. holds you up. No, 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 no. Let, no, let, no, let no. me let, let, let me just say one thing. Okay, one word in closing. A, when you have a very high population density in a building and inadequate transport systems up and down, it stands to reason that you will need more maintenance and maybe an operator 24 hours a day. But it's day. the terror that keeps you from no, having no, no, the no, maintenance. No, 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 Yes, 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 yes. No, there are people who live there every day, who have been living there every day, whose greatest terror is having to walk up 16 flights of stairs. Good okay. okay, that is sheer terror. Okay, on that note, we're going to have to move on. Thank you very much. Uh, one other comment on Cabrini Green, and then we're going to move on to another call, and then on to uh, uh, some other subjects. Uh, by taking charge of the issue, like Mayor Byrne has done, and the situation at Cabrini Green, is that not an indictment against the alderman, uh, the congresswoman, Curtis Collins, George Dunn, uh, and all those that represent that particular the police area. Force, the CHA, you know, what Tom and everybody. Really, excuse me, what Tom is really being misunderstood is driving the gangs out really means, I believe, less toleration for the unlawful activity. It doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to move. It means their acts aren't going to be tolerated. And what it really is focused in on, and the gentleman, although he was a little confused, in this discussion, really pointed in on the fact that if we point some spotlight on what's going on there, instead of ignoring it, it can't go on. I think that's what you meant, Tom. Shelley, if I was as articulate as you, I could have said it that way, but you have said it. Right. Okay. <laughs> I concur. Okay. Let us uh, go back to the telephone calls. Good evening. You're on the air. 
Good evening. My name is Ann. Yes, Ann. How are you? I'm fine. And I want to uh, add a question that um, the last caller began to raise, but I want to make it more specific. Okay. Why, instead of moving into Cabrini Green, did not the mayor fire Charlie Swibel for allowing almost a quarter of the families in the project not pay rent? Not to pay rent? That's right. Uh, most of the evictions that are happening are happening yeah. for non-payment of rent. Let me just tell you something, lady. Public housing is housing a last resort. There aren't too many people who are there because it's their first choice. Now, if we were a small town with just six or seven hundred people, there would be no transients because there's no housing for them. But Chicago is a big city like New York or L.A. or Buffalo or Cleveland, and there are a lot of people here who have no resources, and a lot of them wind up in public housing. No, now, they just, don't. The waiting list for public housing is several hundred thousand families long. Several hundred thousand? That's right. I, I don't think that's accurate. The, the, I don't think that that's accurate. But I do think one thing you're saying, which is correct. But I, I don't know what you do with the people who can't afford but public Sheldon housing. Gardner. No, I think a point that we're really slipping away from, and Tom started to get to it when we started kidding in a certain sense, is that it's focusing in on woeful mismanagement. And I will tell you, I think the one thing that Mayor Byrne does, even if it is inadvertently, it, once the attention is focused on Cabrini Green, it means that you've got to have police protection. It means that what's lousy and wrong about the building, the spotlight starts coming in. And many of us who for a long time talk about Charlie Swibel getting an award for being the least worthy person to hold a job, now we are able to see see the situation on TV much more than we ever had before. And I think she's to be congratulated by bringing more attention to that situation, even though, you know, even though she isn't doing it to clean it up. Well, among the indictments that Mr. Robinson made before the CHA board the other day... Charges. Is that, uh, indictments come from a grand jury. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, indictment is any charge of wrongdoing made in public. It's certainly an indictment. Okay. Go ahead, Ann. He, he made I don't several... worship Webster. <laughs> well, All right, let's let, let Ann, you're on. Webster Go ahead. Webster is taken from OED. I would, I'll ride with mine. Go ahead. At any rate, he cited uh, findings in various HUD evaluations of CHA that say that there is no inventory control, that there is no maintenance control, and that there are no contract controls in CHA. How can we have a manager of a major city institution which is what Charlie Swibel is, continuing his job after bad evaluation after bad evaluation. Everything else in the city is that way. They walked out of the, you saw the pictures on TV of carrying the things out of the city garages. I mean, this is the way Chicago is. I mean, uh, the tragedy of the thing that is, is that Swibel is no worse than the rest of the things in the city. Is it possible? Let me, let, 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 let me pose a question. Is it possible? Because if you look at, at Mayor Burns' record, there are friends who become enemies. There are enemies who become friends, and and and, and there's keeps, some of us who are permanent. <laughs> and, and, and she keeps people on their toes. Is it possible that she will turn on Charlie Swibel, Phil? Well, I mean, anything is possible, but I think it it's um, doubtful uh, that that would happen. But you know, I I don't think Swibel's the you know the the person who should have managed CHA. Uh, or should manage CHA. I'm not sure that there's anybody who really wants to manage It CHA. isn't just Swibel, though. It's Swibel. That's the, it's, that's it's the everybody issue. who's been it's involved not, wait in a minute, it. Wait a, minute. The wait a minute. Cabrini Green went up 20 years ago, so it's everybody that's been involved. Well, except, and remember, the people who put up Cabrini Green and Robert Taylor Holmes, it wasn't May. I mean, Mayor Daly was mayor when the thing was constructed. They were done by federal specifications. They met federal oh, standards. Oh, baloney. It was our filing cabinet to put black people away. So yeah, but wait a minute. Anybody. Wait a minute. Yeah, but it was federal policy. Those, those it was the policy, the machine in the city of Chicago. No, that's, wait a minute. <coughs> to, to, to put it correctly, it was done in St. Louis the same way. It was done in Manhattan the same way. And it was wrong. Uh, of course it was wrong, but those decisions were made academic. by people who lived in Bethesda and Chevy Chase, not by people who lived in Chicago and New York. Those were federal standards. Excuse me, can I correct Mr. Crone for Go a moment? Go ahead, and then we're going to have to move on. You can, you can make a suggestion. Under um, the advice of the same academic, a man named Homer Hoyt, who in fact wrote the real estate appraiser's guidebook that's used by FHA and is used as a classic text in, in every appraiser's course, all of which is based on ethnicity. And he is the man that advised the city, was, was the chief consultant to the city during 
the original zoning plans drawn up by the city in the 1940s. Where was the federal government in the guidelines? Why? How come is it that the similar type of housing was Pruitt Igo in St. Louis? Because he also was advisor to the FHA. Oh, he was. Yeah. So then, it, but then it's then you concur. You're not correcting me. You're well, concurring with you. what I'm saying. It didn't I'm, matter I'm if he was an advisor to the CHA Daily in Chicago because the federal government is the one that set the standards and approved them. No, and the way I'm speaking I'm now is the way Mayor Daley spoke. That there was concurrence on the part of Mayor Daley in that kind of standards in that he hired Homer Hoyt as the chief consultant to the city of Chicago in planning such projects. Okay. And, and he did it knowingly. And on that note, I thank you for calling. Uh, you've obviously got a, a lot of uh, facts okay. at your hand. Uh, Phil would disagree with it. No, I want to say one other thing. Okay, one last thing. Get, okay. Oh. Go ahead. Uh, the problems of CHA are very simple to solve. Very simple. And maybe this lady shares some of the feelings I have. Number one, you cannot have 100% high-rise poor communities. And if you have them, you have to give them the same security that you would give 100% high-rise middle-income communities. You couldn't operate 3950 Lakeshore Drive with successfully without the kind of security it has. Anybody has access to elevators and stairwells in public housing. If you had that at 3950, it'd be the same mess. Secondly, uh, in the terms of not only economic mix but security, there are no services. There's no place to shop. There's no place for recreation. It's just housing in the in these ghettos. And and Where instead housing. of in, pardon warehousing, but but the warehousing is not is not so bad if it had the amenities. If you have amenities and security, you wouldn't call them warehouses. You don't call Lakeshore Drive warehouses. But there are no children in those high rises on the there lake. Are, Very few. You know that, Phil. Thirty nine fifty or any of those buildings don't have. Oh, oh, Shelly, um, you're wrong. There are a growing number of kids in the condos in there. Not no, anywhere near. You get not too. anywhere right. near Thank the you, number Ann. of kids. You're, in high you're, all, you're also missing 3950, which has some uh, some crime problems as well that okay. I'm aware of. We have, and thank you very much. You brought up some interesting points. Uh, we've got wait, wait, about wait. Uh, two minutes left. We've, we've got to move on. I want to send a message to Ann. Ann, call me at 421-6651 uh, late tonight or early tomorrow morning because I'd like to talk to you on a serious basis about. Oh, okay. Well, we can't. We That's can't do. Home number, we, we, we we can't. Uh, we can't communicate the personal messages on the air. It's against the FCC. Okay. We got about I two minutes. But the number is okay. no, no, for, six, six, it. <laughs> okay. We've got about two about minutes left. Carpeting? Anyway, Reagan is ending public radio, so it isn't going to matter anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Tom, we've got to turn to you. You are yes. you are a professional lobbyist. That's what you yes. do. One of the big stories that is about to pop in Washington deals with a lobbyist by the name of Paula Parkinson, yes. who allegedly Better has had an advice of counsel. He has nothing to say. <laughs> who allegedly has had sex with a number of members of Congress. For the most part, they are Republicans. Can you share any light on on that? Uh, scandal that is about to break. Well, I can't share light on it so far. <laughs> yes, uh, I think light has been sh uh, has, has been shed on it. I think that what's going to happen is is that a number of prominent members of Congress are going to be embarrassed when she discloses the fact that she has videotapes uh, showing them in in the performing arts, so to speak. And uh, I think that uh, it is. Do they really exist? What is the scuttle uh, in Washington? She maintains and is talking to the Justice Department that says that uh, she has the tapes. What uh, what interest the Justice Department is is if there were votes cast as a result of some of the performances on the videotape which would cause somebody to cast a vote. Unfortunately, or fortunately, she has conservative Republicans who ordinarily would be voting along straight party lines anyway. According they should only indict liberal Democrats <laughs> yeah. who did it, right? According to, according to published reports, there are a number of members of the Illinois congressional delegation that are involved. Is that true based on the scuttle you know? From what I hear, that uh, it is true that a number of Illinois members are uh, 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 certainly uh, ha have certainly been mentioned by her in connection with her visits in the Justice Department. I didn't, think we had that lively. I didn't think we had that lively a delegation. Yeah. <laughs> this might solve reapportionment. <laughs> yeah. It could be. We could lose uh, a lot more congressmen than... Uh, we, that need <laughs> <laughs> we need to. We need to. 
<laughs> oh, it's been a rough show for me to this evening. I hope that uh, you have enjoyed it as much as everyone here at the table has enjoyed it. Our guest this evening, Tom Roser, president of the City Club of Chicago, Sheldon Gardner, past president of the Independent Voters of Illinois and the state chairman of the Illinois John Anderson campaign, and Philip Crone, uh, well-known political consultant and campaign strategist. They have been here this evening. I hope you've enjoyed the program. I thank you very much for joining us this Thursday night. Next Thursday night, we're going to talk more about politics, and don't forget, two weeks from tonight, we're going to be talking about whatever happened to the Republican Party in the city of Chicago. I'm Bruce Dumont. Thank you very much. We'll see you next Thursday night at 7 o'clock. So long, everybody.